This doesn't spin like a turbine or anchor into the earth. It floats, pulling power from places that towers can't reach. High above the hills and rooftops, the wind is different, stronger, smoother, unseen. For years, engineers have chased it with wings and wires, hoping to unlock a cleaner kind of energy, one that flies instead of stands. But the sky doesn't give up its secrets easily. And what seems simple from the ground becomes chaos up there. Still, something is happening, quietly, persistently, because this time, we're not just building into the wind, we're learning how to become part of it. Why chase the sky? For over a century, wind turbines have stood tall, slowly growing in size, strength, and complexity. But no matter how massive they've become, they remain chained to the ground. Their blades slice air near the surface, where wind is weaker, more erratic, shaped by trees, hills, and buildings. Higher up, it's different. The wind is faster, more consistent, and far less disturbed by the terrain below. That's where airborne wind energy comes in. Instead of building taller towers, why not just let the generator fly? With no need for concrete foundations, no massive steel towers, and far fewer raw materials, these systems promise more power with less footprint. Lightweight kites, gliders, and soft wings can reach altitudes up to 800 meters, where the wind can be twice as strong. The idea is both elegant and radical. Tap into the sky without reshaping the land. It's not just about efficiency. It's about access, bringing wind power to places where turbines can't go. Remote islands, fragile terrain, temporary installations. This is energy ungrounded. And if it works, it could rewrite what's possible, not just for renewables, but for how we relate to the wind itself. Two ways to fly. Fly gen versus ground gen. Not all airborne wind systems fly the same way. There's a quiet divide in the sky. Two philosophies, two competing methods, and each comes with its promise and peril. The first is called fly gen. Here, the generator lives on the aircraft itself. A glider, balloon, or drone catches the wind, spins rotors, and sends electricity down a conductive tether to the ground. It's compact, self-contained, and elegant in theory. But it also puts all the complexity in the air, electronics, weight, and failure points. When something breaks, it falls. The second is ground gen. This approach flips the logic. The kite or wing isn't generating power directly. It's pulling. As it flies in tight figure eight patterns, the tension on the tether spins a ground-based drum or generator. When it turns out, it produces electricity. When it reels back in, it resets, ready to fly again. Less weight in the air, more control on the ground. It's a choice between flying power plants and mechanical puppets, between keeping the intelligence in the sky and anchoring it below. Neither system is perfect, but both keep asking the same question. How do you tame the wind without trying to stop it? The physics of flight and power. Wind energy isn't just about wind speed, it's about how you move through it. That's why airborne systems don't just float, they fly. In arcs, loops, and figure eights. Because when a kite slices sideways across the wind, it doesn't just drift, it accelerates. And the faster it moves, the more lift it creates. The more lift, the more pull. And the more pull, the more power. It's called crosswind flight and it's the secret behind many airborne wind systems. Instead of riding the wind like a sailboat, these machines cut across it like a race car hugging a curve. The result? The apparent wind hitting the wing can be several times faster than the ambient wind. Since wind power increases with the cube of wind speed, even a modest gain in speed can lead to massive increases in output. But this flight isn't simple. These kites aren't just tugging ropes, they're executing precise, three-dimensional dance routines guided by onboard sensors and automated control systems. One wrong move and the entire loop collapses. No energy, no flight. Still, if you can master the rhythm, it's like pulling electricity straight from the sky, not by force, but by finesse. When giants fell, 
Ambition filled the sky long before results did. In 2005, a company named Alteros unveiled the BAT, a helium-filled airborne wind turbine shaped like a giant inflatable donut. Suspended 300 meters above ground, it floated in place and spun a 30-kilowatt turbine, sending power down through its tether. Remote villages, disaster zones, rugged mountains. This was the dream. Clean power where no turbine could stand. But that dream deflated. The BAT quietly disappeared, and Alteros pivoted to aerial communications. Why? The wind wasn't the problem. Economics was. Then came Makani. Backed by Google X and later Alphabet, this was the boldest flygen attempt yet. A 600-kilowatt flying wing with eight rotors, elegant, autonomous, and years in the making. It flew. It generated. But it couldn't convince. In 2020, Alphabet pulled funding, calling the path longer and riskier than hoped. Makani crashed figuratively, then literally. Both systems proved that the sky could work. They just couldn't make it work cheaply enough, reliably enough, or simply enough. Their fall wasn't from the wind. It was from weight, of complexity, of cost, of expectation. And yet, their failures left behind something more valuable than power. Data, insight, and caution for those still chasing altitude. Sky sails, a kite that doesn't quit. In a world of ambitious prototypes and silent shutdowns, SkySails has quietly done the unthinkable. They got a kite to work and keep working. Not a toy, not a demo, but a real grid-connected airborne wind energy system. Launched, recovered, repeated. Their design looks simple. A soft, inflatable kite tethered to a ground station with a winch and a generator. But behind that simplicity is seven years of engineering. The kite unfolds in the wind, climbs to altitude, and begins tracing a figure eight in the sky. As it flies out, it pulls the tether with increasing force, spinning the generator below and producing electricity. When it reaches full extension, it adjusts its angle of attack, reducing tension so the tether can be reeled back in, using only a fraction of the power it just produced. Then it does it again. SkySails says its systems have been operating since 2021 on the hurricane-prone island of Mayo, a place where traditional turbines can't survive. Their 100 to 200 kilowatt units are available for order right now. And unlike many in this space, they've passed third-party power curve tests. It's not flashy, but it flies. And in this field, that's everything. Kite power, the flying battery. If SkySails is about persistence, Kite Power is about portability. Their system, called the Hawk, doesn't look like a power plant. It looks like a shipping container, because it is one. Inside that container, a soft wing kite, a lightweight fiberglass frame, a ground-based generator, a 400-kilowatt battery, and all the automation needed to fly. Once deployed, the Hawk can produce 30 kilowatts of power for up to 10 hours. It launches on its own. It flies itself. It lands itself. No tower, no crane. Just air, cable, and code. It's designed for remote islands, military bases, and anywhere that diesel generators still rule the grid. Setup takes a single day. The whole system operates within a 50-meter radius. The tether, seven times lighter than steel, transmits mechanical tension with incredible efficiency. Its motion is guided by sensors and software that track the kite's position in real time, adjusting flight paths on the fly. Right now, it's flying in Aruba, learning to adapt to new wind conditions and proving it can hold its own in variable climates. Like SkySails, Kite Power sees its future not in megawatts, but in mobility, power that goes where it's needed, and leaves no scars behind. Tangled in regulation and risk, Getting a kite into the sky is hard. Keeping it there legally is harder. These systems exist in a regulatory blur. Drone, generator, aircraft. No category fits cleanly. In Europe, some are classed as drones. Elsewhere, they're treated like buildings. Both come with red tape. Then there's trust. Investors want simple, predictable. Airborne wind is neither. 
These systems fly in turbulent 3D wind fields. A sensor glitch or a software bug can send it crashing. Even a 99% success rate isn't enough if the 1% causes headlines. And without long-term flight data, funding stays scarce. Without funding, refinement stalls. It's a loop. And for now, it's grounding even the most promising designs. A revolution still waiting to land. Airborne wind energy feels overdue. The tech exists. The logic is sound. But it's still a niche, not a revolution. Why? Time. Most systems haven't proven they can last through seasons, storms, or years of wear. They fly, but only briefly. Scaling is also tough. Multiple kites require coordination. Tethers can tangle. Autonomy must become choreography. And then there's doubt. If this worked, wouldn't we have airborne wind farms already? But history disagrees. Solar and offshore wind also took decades to mature. Maybe this is just step one. For now, it's a field defined by promise and hesitation. But every figure eight drawn in the sky brings us closer to an answer. This isn't about turbines anymore. It's about trust. Trusting software to ride the wind. Trusting fabric and cable to replace steel and concrete. Trusting that energy doesn't have to roar to be real. Somewhere right now, a kite is flying, not for fun, but for power. Its flight is quiet, its rhythm relentless. And maybe, just maybe, it's showing us a new way forward. A future where energy floats, where the sky isn't just above us, it's part of the grid. These machines don't just defy gravity, they defy expectation. Because sometimes the best way to move forward is to let go.